Hi friends, it's Penny here, and I have something very rare and exclusive to share. Through a friend of a friend's friend, I was able to sit down for a few minutes with the famed Polish pianist and statesman Ignacy Jan Paderewski. Yes, Paderewski, that same pianist who graced the concert stages of the world at the turn of the 20th century. Now, how is it possible that she is able to speak with someone who's been dead for nearly 80 years, you ask? Well, let me just say that this friend of a friend's friend holds seances. <laughs> And when she learned of my interest in the piano and the great Paderewski, she offered to conjure him up just for me. You can imagine my delight upon being invited to interview a pianist born in 1860. So, the day arrived via video chat, of course, due to the pandemic, and there before me was the great man himself. Now, having prepared my questions and rigged up the camera in advance, I was able to film my conversation with Paderewski. As I was most keen to hear the master's thoughts on piano playing in particular, and I am hopeful that students of the piano will be watching and taking note, I posed to Paderewski questions about practicing the life of an artist, and other related topics. And now, here is my recent interview with Ignacy Jan Paderewski. Hello, Paderewski. Greetings to you, Miss Johnson. My goodness, but what a delight it is to speak with you today. I never thought it possible to have an opportunity such as this. Thank you for being with us and sharing your memories. This is no trouble, actually. I am rather pleased to be here at all, myself, in, uh, what year did you say? 2021, is it? My goodness, how time does fly. But... As you well know, the creative process is ever youthful. Yes, indeed. Now, to start off our conversation, I thought perhaps uh, you might share an anecdote from your career, uh, something so as to give our viewers, uh, many of which I suspect are themselves budding pianists, an inkling, if you will, as to the sheer quantity of people for whom you performed. Uh, you were, after all, uh, to quote the doctoral thesis of a <clears throat> certain somebody, the biggest box office attraction in the history of the piano. Thank you for that, my dear. Well, now, let me think. Ah, yes. Here's a story I shan't forget. Now, you must realize that giving a recital is a tremendous ordeal, a great strain on mind, nerves, and body. All one's powers are taxed to the utmost. A recital is not a time for personal enjoyment. It is not, as you say in America, a picnic. This particular recital was a very arduous one, I had played a program of some two and a half hours with many encores and was extremely exhausted and in no condition to further tax my strength. Fortunately, I did not realize what was in store for me at the reception. Otherwise, I think I should never have had the courage to go in spite of my promise. When I reached the reception, I found, to my amazement, practically the whole of my audience waiting to speak to me, and I was obliged to stand in line and shake hands with everybody. 
It was a ghastly ordeal, and finally my right hand became so swollen and inflamed that I had to offer my left hand. There were about a thousand people there, and each one shook hands twice. It was a dreadful experience. I said to myself, another reception like this, and I shall not be able to play ever any more. A thousand people? Oh my, and twice each? You certainly were of a sturdy stock to endure the life of a touring pianist. Well then, that leads in nicely to my next question, which relates to your work ethic. Can you talk a little bit about what is required of an artist, and uh, perhaps the act of practicing and the overall creative process? Of course. Now you say you are a pianist as well? Yes, I am. Excellent. Very good. Well then, I must tell you that it took me half my life to realize that there are two ways of using the piano. The one is to play, the other is to work. If you use the one, you will never achieve anything. You are carried away with your own emotion and with the emotion of the content of the work you are playing and you might spend the whole of your life playing without learning anything. You can become drunk in any art on your own emotion. A great many people are wasting their time in that way, arriving at no results at all. While working, of course, you must suffer. You have absolutely no pleasure only the effort and pain. You see, all this time I was playing, not working. I only began really working ten years later. And still to this moment I have to fight that inclination to play, because it is so tedious to work. At that time I did not realize, because I did not know how to work. But this I did know from the start, that there must be somebody or something which would force one to work, not to play. Well, I found it, but many years later. That's very interesting. Yes, it is an enormous responsibility. To be sure. And, you know, I want now, even at the risk of repeating myself, to say that the average person, or the great public, let me say, has no idea of the amount of practice necessary, absolutely necessary, in the presentation of a concert. It is not sufficient to know and to play well, or even beautifully, the numbers arranged. It is not sufficient to have played the same program the week before, and even to repeat it the next day without incredible hours of practice and concentration. And so it is with every performance, hours of practice and mental work, and all this in addition to the never-ending finger practice. Shall I call it the technique? That is why it is so necessary for sufficient time between concerts for preparation of each program as you play it. This lack of time, the rush of one concert after another upon my arrival in New York, was something unheard of to me. Something I was utterly unprepared to face, and I was overwhelmed with the sheer physical aspect of the task before me. But youth was on my side, and an unbounded ambition and will to conquer, though the labor involved was superhuman, 
I am still paying in flesh and blood for my first New York season. And that was in the year 1891, was it not? Yes, that's it. And if I may get back to your question regarding the creative process, I have this to say, that there is only one thing that is truly and continuously satisfying in life, and that is creative work. Creative work, take it as you will, is the only thing in life that gives supreme satisfaction. Ideas are eternal. In presenting them, one reaches the loftiest heights. The form of presentation makes no difference. By creative work, one gives oneself new life. Creative work kills death. This theme is a tempting one to elaborate. While you are composing, you live in a certain atmosphere which excludes everything else practically. For instance, it excludes practicing because practicing is practically spade work, the drudgery. It is an absolute necessity and it is the tragic side of a musical artist, that necessity of continuous practicing. If you are a painter, a sculptor, or an architect, if you are an engineer, a builder of canals, or bridges, or towers, and so on, you learn your art, or I should say technique, forever. It remains always with you, your technique, your facility. You can remain for years without using the brush or the pencil. And yet, when you start again, you have the same facility at your command. With the musician, especially an executive musician like the pianist or the violinist, it is absolutely impossible. You are obliged to practice with your fingers so many hours a day in order to maintain their flexibility. And I repeat, this is equally true of both a violinist and pianist. Even the singer's art needs constant practice, although it is not as exacting and tiresome in its demands. Yes, for the pianist, it is constant torture and privation. It deprives you of so many, not only pleasures, but necessary things in life. It prevents you from reading, from thinking, from developing your intellect, this practicing every day, the indispensable hours. Yes, it is a difficult life. I have always admired your tone at the piano, your velvety round singing tone, never harsh. I understand it has uh, something to do with the shape of one's fingertips. Was it Anton Rubinstein you heard in this regard? Ah, uh, yes, dear Anton. His tone was extremely beautiful, perhaps because of those wonderful fat fingers of his. He had, you know, fat hands with fat fingertips, which always produce a most beautiful tone. Yes, it does help. You know, as a Bach player, I would love to hear your thoughts on this composer. Ah, a word that I would gladly proclaim to all the world. Every pianist should play Bach. Without studying Bach, he would really be no pianist at all, particularly on account of Bach's supreme polyphonic style, which contributes enormously to the technical development of the pianistic art. The pianistic art is a great art because it combines the beauty of ideas with that polyphonic mastership of which Bach was the supreme exponent. He is, for me, a kind of divinity in music. Musically speaking, Bach is a universal genius. 
Bach is a giant. Yes, a hundred percent. Thank you for that. I wonder, Paderewski, if you might now share some stories about the experience of actually being on stage. Well, as you know, stage deportment is of the utmost importance. One must sound and look good. This reminds me of an episode with the great composer, Richard Strauss. Oh, do tell! It was while I was studying in Berlin that I began to meet some famous musicians that were very helpful to me. I met Richard Strauss at the house of my publisher, Bach. It was a very amusing household, consisting of his wife, his mother, and several charming children, for whom I used to play. And the children liked me very much, consequently. Sometimes we came in the evening, Strauss and myself, and some other musicians of lesser importance than Strauss. And just to amuse the children, we played for them, he and I. Dance music. On some occasions, the company was not only composed of children, but of adults too. And the atmosphere was so gay, so intimate, that everyone wanted to dance. So, we used to play for hours, Strauss and myself, I remember. Strauss's playing was not very brilliant. He was not a pianist, but he was chiefly a composer all his life. He turned to conducting later on, but he was always very fond of dance music. He adored it, and it was delightful to listen to him. But there was one great drawback to the enjoyment of his playing, and that was also a factor which determined me to study the expression of my own face when playing, namely the awful grimaces Strauss made while at the piano. It was too amusing for words to see, but it was also rather painful. One felt almost embarrassed for him. It was really a show in itself, an additional performance. And now I will say a word about my own habit of making such unpleasant grimaces, for I was guilty too, and was sometimes ridiculed by my colleagues. I had, as a student, to postpone overcoming that because I never practiced long enough to watch myself. But when I arrived in Berlin, and particularly after seeing Strauss at the piano, I knew that it was a grave impediment in the career of an artist, and I then studied all my difficult passages with a mirror before me and absolutely surmounted that difficulty, but only after months and months of watching myself. It was really very hard, because I was already a little over 24, and it had become a fixed habit. I surmounted that difficulty to such an extent that I may say now, without any exaggeration, I do not know whether there is any other pianist who can keep himself as quiet and as much master of his appearance while playing the most difficult music as I. But it was a very great effort, and I was never told these things except by my schoolmates at the conservatory, who made fun of me at the beginning. So, I have always been grateful to Strauss 
for making me realize the importance of overcoming this obnoxious habit. Yes, that's interesting, and well worth mentioning, particularly nowadays with online-only concerts. Uh, and what about the conditions of the hall? Conditions. I mean conditions that affect one have so much to do with the success of one's public appearance. The atmosphere of the hall, the lighting, the piano stool, the condition of the piano, these mechanical things, how they add to the nervousness and strain of each appearance. For instance, a dimly lighted hall is an absolute necessity for me. And here, let me say, I have often been criticized and misunderstood on that score, and it has been considered an affectation. But it is really nothing of the sort. I simply cannot stand a brilliant light shining into my eyes when playing. It deprives me of all comfort and repose. It is a nervous irritation that is unbearable. And that is the reason I avoid playing with orchestra. There is so much light on the stage. There must be, naturally, to enable the musicians to see their music, that it becomes a positive torture to me. That torture I had to endure in the early days of my career. As long as I was a beginner, I had to accept everything that came to me. I could not command, I had to obey. But as soon as I could command, I had a comfortable dim light in the hall. And for many years, I never gave a concert with the brightly lighted stage. When I had authority to demand certain things with energy, I started that innovation. Occasionally, a mistake is made, and the electricians do just the opposite of what I want. They put down the lights in the hall and put up the lights very brilliantly on the platform. That affects me so much that I actually run away from the audience and do not reappear until things have been put into proper order. Naturally, many people fail to understand this and think it pretentious a pose on my part, but, I repeat, it is a necessity for me. I am affected by it as by an infirmity. I cannot look straight into the light. Yes, there really are so many aspects involved with the making of a first-rate performance. If you don't mind, uh, I have to ask, if you ever had a nickname? Yes, indeed. I may perhaps mention now that for the first time I then had the company of some real boys when I entered the Warsaw Conservatory. Up to then, I had spent my life only with my sister. I had no playmates, really. I was practically alone, and it is a very tedious life for a boy always to be with a girl, and only one girl, and that girl a sister. But we digress. Let us return to the conservatory. There I found boys of my own age. Some of them were very lively, and it had a great effect upon me and I changed in a short time into quite a different creature. A new energy came to me. I became extremely mischievous, quick in my movements, and sometimes even did things which were not at all 
pleasant, particularly to the older students, the young men of twenty-two or more, who did not relish my pranks. As I was so very quick in my movements, and my hair was so very red at that time, all my colleagues called me Squirrel. We had only red squirrels in Poland. We knew nothing about these gray squirrels in America. So, Squirrel was an appropriate name for me at that time, in the mischievous days. Well, that's funny, but rather appropriate and very charming. Yes, so many gray squirrels here in Canada as well. <laughs> well, now I'm afraid we've run out of time. I don't want the spell to break and lose you. So, to close, I wonder if you might share uh, a humorous anecdote. Certainly. And I have just the one. It is amazing to realize what absurd things will interest and move an audience to laughter. Almost anything and nothing will often cause them to be as pleased as children. And sometimes they laugh as easily at tragedy as at comedy. Every artist has lived through trying and agonizing experiences. I have had my full share of them, and there was one audience in my early career, when I was still quite young, that I furnished unwittingly with a rare bit of comedy. I remember this concert very distinctly, and that I was late in arriving, and in a great hurry which did not often happen. At any rate, I came very late to dress and had to hurry. I jumped into a cab and drove to the concert hall, quite unconscious of the appearance I presented. But as I stepped on to the platform, I realized that something was quite wrong. For even before I reached the piano, the people sitting near the stage entrance burst into laughter. Hearty laughter, I may say. I took a few more steps towards the piano, but as the laughter increased, I turned to look at the offenders, and found to my horror on turning that my braces or as you call them, suspenders, were hanging and dangling far down below my coat. It was an awful moment. There was only one thing to be done. I ran away. Of course, literally made a dash for the exit, which I accomplished successfully, but with more laughter. In a minute or two, I got myself in order and returned to the stage. I must say that my second entrance was a difficult one to make, but the audience was splendid. There was no more laughter, only very encouraging applause, and the recital went on without further disaster. Oh, that's wonderful. We all have enjoyed so very much getting to see and hear you. Thank you, Paderewski. Goodbye. Goodbye, my child. And there you have it. A rare conversation with the great Paderewski. Thanks for watching.